Okay, if everyone could find their seats, we're going to start the afternoon session. So I'd appreciate it if everyone could find their seats. And we're going to start out with a contest, right? A drawing. <laughs> Thank you, Al. So, as announced in the beginning, I have this little wizard, uh, lizard with me, uh, which wants to have a new home. Uh, I already heard people raising concerns. Oh, can I get this with me in the airplane or so? Uh, he, she, it, whatever, he does not buy it. So there should be no reason not to get it with you into the plane. Yeah? But we never know what, uh, what the border control or whoever says to it, yeah? because it's big and all this stuff. So we took our time uh, over lunch, and I have some candidates, and hopefully the people are in the room. And the first chance gets Wendy Schauer. Wendy Schauer. All right, we have one. Thank you. So, thank you, Wendy. That's yours. All right, thank you. Hey, good luck. All right, thank you, everybody. Come on in and sit down and let's get going again. Listen, it's a real pleasure to be moderating this panel. We have the home team here. You can't come to Boulder and not hear from NREL, the National Renewable Energies Lab, and we're just so pleased uh, that Steve Hammond and a couple of his uh, colleagues are here today. Uh, we thought it would just be a terrific idea uh, to have them participate and give us an update on some of the real cutting edge uh, computational work that's uh, underway here. As a number of you know, NREL has one of the newer uh, supercomputer centers uh, in the DOE system. Uh, and Steve Hammond, who will be speaking first, is the uh, head of that supercomputing center. Uh, also joining him is Mike Sprague, uh, who is a senior scientist in the center uh, also. Uh, his research interests include computational mechanics of fluids and structures and numerical methods for modeling. And then also Vlad Stavanovich is a senior scientist, but in the Material Science Center here at NREL. And he's also an assistant professor at the Metallurgical and Materials Engineering Department at Colorado School of Mines. So we have a full Colorado contingency here, and we look forward to hearing from you guys about what's going on. Steve, do you want to kick it off? Thank you, Susie. Um, so I want to... Um, thank IDC and the organizers for inviting us to speak. Um, it is a pleasure going to a meeting and having it as a home game. I think it's 15 minutes from my garage to the parking lot here. It's closer than getting to the lab. Um, and so when I was, I spoke at this meeting a year ago in Seattle and I talked about our data center, um, talked about the, our energy efficiency and our um, what we were doing, and so I wanted to elaborate a bit on how we operate the center, our role, where we sit in the DOE complex, um, and uh, so I'm going to give sort of a broad brush of the types of applications that we're supporting, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike and to Vlad to talk about um, research in um, modeling the, the flow physics of whole wind plants, so that's a capability type of problem, and then Vlad for a material science, which is more of an ensemble and a, a capacity um, kind of application. See if this goes. Hmm. Yep. Um, so I, I, I'm guessing most know the um, structure of the Department of Energy as it pertains to the upper left portion, right? So there's NNSA, um, which is the full left part of the org chart the Office of Science and Energy under um, Deputy Secretary Lynn Orr. The first box under there is the Office of Science. If you go two boxes below that, highlighted in red, I'm not sure, you probably can't see the eye chart. So that's the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. There's, off, there's also Environmental Management. So there's a number of energy offices under um, Lynn Orr. So we're a, a 
Uh, our sponsor, our primary sponsor is the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, and it's a sister office, if you will, or, or companion office to the Office of, of Science. Um, so the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy has 11 offices um, within it, much like um, Office of Science has uh, basic energy research, or basic energy sciences, biological and environmental research, um, and um, fusion, high energy physics, and nuclear physics. The EERE offices um, span um, three directorates from renewable power to energy efficiency to sustainable transportation, and that includes solar, geothermal, wind, and water. Um, in the efficiency side, it's homes, buildings, advanced manufacturing, um, government energy management, which looks at um, improving the efficiency of buildings within the government complex. Um, and then um, you imagine in transportation, there's vehicles, fuels, and um, hydrogen and fuel cells. So when we look at the DOE portfolio of computing, most of the focus to the meeting to date has been at the sort of tip of the spear, the leading edge um, systems um, driven by Office of Science and NSA. Um, there's also lots of institutional computing systems sort of sitting in there, and I think it's been mentioned there's a sort of a missing middle. Um, and looking at HPC resources for the energy offices, something that maybe 10% of the leadership class system. And it's um, not just hardware, but what EERI is looking to do is to establish computational science modeling and simulation as a means for advancing their mission, just as the Office of Science and NSA has done for theirs over the past decades. So we're relatively newer, um, but the, the focus is on um, sort of developing a culture of high-performance computing and modeling and simulation for the energy offices and to fill a gap that's not being met at the leadership class system. So it's, it's not just hardware, but it, there's expertise, there's domain expertise in doing something that's indigenous at, at the other labs and offices. So our, our role, the mandate is we are at NREL, um, we provide the primary facility for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy for providing high performance computing. Um, the system we have, which is a 1.2 petaflop system, is the largest system in the world dedicated to renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, and go on. So we are EERE's only laboratory. Um, compared to NSF and the other parts of DOE, we're relatively new to large scale computing for advancing the mission. Um, we're in the process of working with EER leader, leadership on defining long-term HPC strategy and the stewardship plan. Um, our objectives are to meet the computational needs of EERE-funded projects, um, independent of where that work is conducted. So EERE actually has projects at, at most of the labs in the lab complex, as well as universities, and they provide support to industry. So whether that work is at NREL or at the other labs, we're positioned to support that work. Um, we're looking to advance scientific discovery and have impact, um, to, again, to develop and nurture a culture of computational sciences for the breadth of the EERE mission and establish productive and efficient facilities to support the computational capabilities. Um, if you were at the meeting last year, we talked about our um, High Performance Computing Data Center. Um, we have a, a brand new 182,000 square foot research facility, the data center sits in the middle, um, indicated with the um, orange arrow. Um, so we have 10,000 square feet of usable, uninterrupted floor space. That's our raised floor. It's a 10 megawatt capable um, facility. Um, it's a lead platinum facility, and we've operated for the last year and a half. Our running average at PUE is, is below 1.06, so we're, we're very efficient. Um, we use evaporative cooling only. Um, we take advantage of our dry, cool nights. Um, so we were able to build this um, at a lower cost than if we had built a less efficient, if we were using mechanical chillers, and our operating expenses are much lower um, relative to other data centers. Um, we've driven um, direct component level liquid cooling, so our cooling supply is 75 Fahrenheit water. Um, we get 110 Fahrenheit degree um, water back, so we do um, Heat, um, waste heat capture and reuse, so it's a primary heat source for our full laboratory building. Um, um, we have a few fans, but mostly it's, it's pumps, and pumps are much more efficient 
um, for cooling than, than lots of fans. Um, we've adopted a holistic view of, of the data center from chips to bricks, and so we've integrated our um, compute capability into the data center and the data center into the campus. And we're actually over the summer we were exporting heat from outside of our building to other places on campus. Um, so part of that was our data center mission. So we're we're advancing energy efficiency. Um, we're looking ahead towards much larger systems, and if you're not paying attention to efficiency, your operating costs can exceed. Um, your capital costs for acquiring your systems. And if you're looking at an exascale system with 20 megawatts, you're going to pay probably a million dollars a megawatt year for, to operate that system. And if you're not efficiently powering and cooling it, um, you know, the, the millions of dollars start to add up um, very significantly. So beyond power usage effectiveness, we're also looking at water usage, um, advancing liquid cooling and energy efficiency looking at reducing carbon footprint in the computing enterprise, um, advancing um, waste heat capture and reuse, and also energy management, um, demand response, and shifting loads. Um, how do we do that within a, a um, quality of service agreement with our applications? So we go through an annual um, allocation process. Um, we're in the midst of reviewing and allocating our system for the FY16 year. It's modeled somewhat after the ALCC process um, conducted by the Office of Science, um, but it's driven by EERE programmatic milestones. Um, so, we, um, let me see. so we're ensuring our resources are aligned with the mission, so people who are requesting time, we want to make sure that's aligned with um, projects that are funded within the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. So that's um, aligned with milestones, part of EERE solicitations, um, and then within the ER EERE mission space. So our current um, compute capabilities, uh, our system is called Peregrine. It's a 1.2 petaflop peak. Uh, we have 1,440 nodes, uh, mostly Intel Xeon, some Xeon plus phi nodes. Um, we're in the process of adding another uh, petaflop, so that's 1,152 additional dual socket Xeon nodes um, are arriving Monday. Um, so we'll have one, a 2.2 petaflop peak system um, that'll be available for use starting November 1st. Um, we have Mellanox uh, InfiniBand Interconnect. Um, we do have a three petabyte uh, luster uh, based on DBN file system. We've got a seven petabyte uh, Sun Oracle storage tech. Um, the old storage tech facility was just across uh, 36 here. Um, so we've got a, our tape library. We also have an insight center for um, immersive, interactive um, scientific visualization and data analytics to go with this. If you wonder where our projects are, um, during fiscal year 15, we're supporting 68 projects. Um, the big three in terms of 75% of our workload is in uh, wind and water power modeling and simulation, um, bioenergy applications, and solar energy. Um, we also do uh, work in buildings efficiency, um, energy systems and grid modernization modeling, some computational science projects, and then um, vehicles. Um, we have a very mixed workload. Um, we have some um, traditional capability, large uh, jobs that take you know, a good fraction of the system, but we also have a lot of jobs that do parametric studies. I would say our workloads differ from typical sort of Office of Science workloads in that they're engineering and optimization. Um, I was joking with the Office of Science program manager and he said, geez, you know, I don't envy you guys. You know, we publish papers and, pardon my French, he says, your shit's got to work, right? So when we're looking at wind turbines and we're looking at PV systems, uh, it's not a existence proof, it's a for all. So they've got to sit in the field and work for 20 years and optimizing the, the materials in use and over the lifetime of the system in various weathering conditions. So there's a lot of engineering optimizations or finding materials that are earth abundant to give the same sort of optical and electrical properties that are desired are important facets. Um, we do a lot of computational screening and guiding of engineering. Um, these are workloads that aren't necessarily sort of um, tightly coupled PDE um, solves of, of traditional Office of Science workloads. Um, we do a lot of resource assessments. We look at, I'll, I'll a little bit more about that, but looking at where there are wind resources or where there are optimal solar resources. 
during diurnal cycles and different seasons and in interannual variability. Um, we also have some jobs that take lots of small node count, and, but they do hundreds of them and they need um, large memory footprint and they need to run for several days at a shot. Um, then uh, we have tight coupling with industry. We have over 340 cooperative research and development agreements with industry. So we have proprietary designs and data that we work with and we can't necessarily just ship that off to a cloud resource somewhere. So taking a look across some of the spectrum of the um, uh, modeling and simulation that we do, Mike is gonna go in a deep dive on this, but um, shifting from modeling individual blades and turbines to whole, looking at the complex um, flow physics of whole wind plants is, is one area that um, we've identified as a clear exascale application. So I'll, I'll let Mike speak to that in, in depth um, when he's up. Um, I mentioned um, um, resource assessments. So we're responsible for providing um, assessments for um, the wind industry and make the data available. So we run, we reanalyze weather data and provide uh, 80 meter um, tower data across all of the continental US at five minute intervals at roughly one to two kilometer resolution so that people interested in deploying wind turbines can know where that's gonna go and we do that over 10 years. So I think we've got, uh, this was in collaboration with uh, three tier and the full data set was 500 terabytes that we make available um, to the wind industry. Um, in fuels, um, uh, we do a lot of molecular dynamics work looking at how enzymes can break down um, cellulose so this is the woody parts of plants. Um, how do we break down the soil? So think of it as like a uh, hardwood floor and how do you peel up the planks of the hardwood floor with the enzymes and break that down to simple sugars that can then be fermented to make um, ethanol. So um, the molecular dynamics use you know many thousands of, of uh, cores um, at its shot for these. And then they do these as, as umbrella samples and, and have, uh, you know, I'm sure if we let them, they would take over our whole system. They're probably our equivalent of the QCD folks. Um, in the vehicles area, there's a lot of interest in um, lithium ion batteries from integrated into vehicle systems and looking at the degradation of lithium ion batteries um, over frequent uh, charge and discharge cycles and how the materials change. So large scale compute resources are allowing um, our folks to look at uh, broader temporal and spatial scales to look at how these materials, how they um, evolve over time and how the grains of the materials shift um, and take on different physical characteristics. Um, you may have seen some of the spectacular videos of lithium ion batter batteries sort of spontaneously um, short circuiting and catching fire. It would be catastrophic if that was in a vehicle. Um, there's a lot of work in traditional strength of the lab is in electronic structure calculations for materials for photovoltaics, both more accurately prediction of the energy levels for point defects as well as looking at crystalline um, structures for improved polycrystalline materials. We're getting close with the supercell size and the modeling and simulation that we can do is now in close agreement to what we observe experimentally. Um, so larger systems has, has been a, a great benefit in looking at um, improved PV materials. Another, probably our fastest growing areas in grid, um, grid modernization and energy systems integration. So um, we use Plexus, which is a, um, a unit commitment software. Um, we've analyzed the entire Eastern interconnect of the US and looked at various scenarios of, of um, higher penetrations of, of wind and PV resources into the grid. And under certain scenarios, how much um, storage would be needed to maintain grid stability if we were to um, shift to say 30, 40, or 50% renewables um, in our um, grid interconnect. Um, one of the last uh, applications I wanted to highlight was um, uh, geothermal well drilling. Um, there's a small company um, just outside of Denver that we work with, they're, they're modeling um, enhanced uh, geothermal well drilling um, so they use ANSYS and they used to do all of their analysis on some workstations and they've been working with us for the past year or so um, to study higher pressure and temperatures and it's been a great turnaround for them um, as they go forward um, 
looking at geothermal wells and where they can get take advantage of some of the oil and gas techniques and use this for geothermal and, and energy recovery there. I think one of the more satisfying things we've gotten is, is for a new center, we've, we've actually um, received some relatively um, high profile accolades both in terms of our efficiency as well as the, the Editor's Choice Award for um, achievement in, in application of HPC for renewable energy. Um, we got, we've received two R&D 100 awards for our um, approach to energy efficient computing with, in collaboration with HP and Intel um, and a DOE sustainability award. So I'm, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to turn it over to Mike to give a, a deep dive on, on uh, wind modeling and then to Vlad for um, materials in solar. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, so as Steve said, I'm going to talk about the modeling work we've been doing and then DOE more broadly has been doing around wind plant modeling. Um, so I'm going to uh, I put Matt Churchfield's name on here. He works at NREL as well, but he works up at the National Wind Technology Center. I'm going to be showing some of his results. So, so a lot of the cool things that I can show today are, are, are his work. Um, I work in the Computational Science Center, but I, I do a lot of basically numerical methods for PDEs, a lot of computational mechanics, so I, I work with the guys up at the wind site quite a bit. Um, now the talk today, I, I really want to talk about, I want to motivate the problem and talk about real opportunities and real challenges that we face trying to do the wind plant problem. Um, I'm going to talk about the wind plant simulation as being a really good exascale problem. Um, talk about what DOE is doing to support this and, uh, and talk a little bit about where we are with the state of the art in, in wind plant simulation. Um, so if, so where's DOE fit in the whole wind energy spectrum? Okay, If you go out there, you're going to see a lot of really big wind turbines out there, big multi-megawatt turbines out there. I would say, and a lot of people would say, that the industry has really figured it out when it comes to putting up a big turbine out in the middle of a field with no other turbines around it. They, they feel pretty confident about it. They can predict what it's going to do pretty well, and they have a fair amount of confidence on how long it's going to last, OK? So I, I don't know that there's a lot we can offer there that they don't already know. When you talk, but if you're talking about wide-scale deployment, and you're trying to make wind power competitive with fossil fuels without subsidies, that means you have to have much greater penetration. That means large wind plants, tens to hundreds or even maybe more wind turbines all in the, in the vicinity, OK? Um, and so there's a, there are quite a few challenges that a wind plant will face, or, or, or I should say a turbine that lives in a wind plant will face a lot of challenges that a turbine out in the field by itself will not face, OK? And that, that really comes down to the fluid dynamics that are going on in that wind plant. Um, so there's, there's a few numbers up here. So, yeah, oops, uh-oh, I'm new to this, Vlad. Am I going the right way? Yes. There we go. All right. So if you, if you, if you think about scaling up the single turbine in a field by itself, and you say, well, I'm going to have 100 of these, right, you're not going to get 100 times scale up, OK? You're going to look at about 20% losses. Um, and this is basically due to, um, uh, uh, the wake interactions, okay? If you're in complex terrain, it's going to be greater than that, 30%, maybe more. Um, we're not going to be able to get rid of that totally, but we can reduce that, all right? So, so the wind plant faces a, a reduction in power output just inherently, that is inherently there, but we can reduce that and we can optimize that, okay? Um, the turbine failure rates are significantly higher in a wind farm. Again, this come, we believe this has to do with the wakes. You're going to see a, a, um, a fatigue loading, if you will, that translates into uh, 
more frequent bearing failures, gearbox failures, and so forth. Um, and then, again, because the industry is not well equipped to optimize and design an entire wind plant, the tools are not there yet, there's a huge uncertainty um, when you're designing this plant and you're gonna say, okay, well, this, this is what our power production is gonna look like, okay? There's a huge uncertainty there. And then the, the, the expression I love to use that I hear in this part of it is the cost of money, okay? Um, so basically, they wanna finance these things, right? And they go to the financiers and they have a huge amount of uncertainty, okay? And, and the people who are financing look at that and, th and they don't like that. So that means cost of money is high. So if, if the wind industry had the tools to reduce that uncertainty, quantify that uncertainty, that means a reduction in the cost of, um, of energy. Um, okay, so opportunities. So where does HPC, where does wind plant modeling come into this? Um, again, this is really about reducing the cost of energy and addressing some of the things I was just talking about. Um, the, the wind plant, again, the, the, the flow dynamics in a wind plant are really poorly understood. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a little bit. It's an extremely complicated system. It, it, I guess maybe my, my, my point here is that if we understood it better, we'd be able to design better plants. All right. Um, and again, I mentioned the tools that the industry has right now for designing wind plants, I would say they're pretty lacking. They're quite low fidelity and they are not validated for wind plants. Um, and again, there's, they present a huge amount of uncertainty, which then translates into how well they can accommodate design standards. Okay. Um, so, so here, what I'm really interested in this, on, on this bullet is how can we take the results from validated high fidelity simulation and translate, tra translate that to better models that are, that are used by the industry. Uh, control systems. Um, control systems is an interesting one because control systems, any improvements to control systems can be applied to wind plants today. All right? what, what can we do with control systems that, that will optimize an existing plant? Some of these other advances, well, that, that's not going to help a wind plant that's already been built. All right? It's not like we can move these turbines around to new places, um, you know, optimize an existing wind plant. But the control systems, any improvements there can have an immediate benefit on production of an existing wind plant. And of course, reduced uncertainty in predicted plant performance. Again, this comes back to new plants, lower cost of money, um, and thereby reducing the cost of energy. And there's, this is um, just one of the wind plant simulations that Matt Churchfield did. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about these, um, where we are with the state of the art in, in a little bit. Um, let's see, okay, so, so we got, hopefully I motivated it well enough. There's a, a lot of opportunities that high performance computing can bring to the wind problem. And for those of you who are familiar with fluid dynamics, um, uh, a cascade of scales causes this to be a very problematic problem, all right? There's a huge span of flow, huge span of flow scales when you're looking at the wind problem, all right? This, this diagram tries to, to illustrate that. Right at the blade surface, you have extremely complicated boundary layer physics. And those play a big role in how that blade performs, which of course plays a role in how the turbine performs. You have the, the blade boundary layer scale, you have the turbine scale, you have the array scale, and of course, while we may be focused on simulations that encompass the entire wind plant, if you don't have the right boundary conditions for that wind plant box, it, it is perhaps uh, not a very valuable thing. So you gotta bring in at least weather scale um, uh, data in some capacity to, to drive your wind plant box. Um, and then if you're really gonna think long term, then who knows, maybe you go out to the climate scale. But this goes from, I think we li listed 10 to the minus five here for a grid cell spacing, um, if you're gonna capture the boundary layer correctly, and then it goes you know, way out there to, to, to climate scales. It depends where you wanna go there. Um, the coupling, the two-way coupling um, varies in its strength on these different scales, but you can see there's a huge span of, uh, of flow scales that we need to deal with. Um, okay, let's look at very complicated flow physics that our models have to capture within the, the wind plant itself. Um, let's see, 
the, um, I'll call out a few of these. So right, I, I just talked about the boundary conditions on your wind plant box, right? So modeling the atmospheric boundary layer in a manner or to a fidelity that is appropriate for a, a wind plant is not an easy thing in itself. Okay, there are a lot of physics going on in there. You have the atmospheric boundary layer. You have the stability. You can see these little plumes coming off the ground. Um, you have these low-level jets that, with today's turbines, capture the, the, the top part of the turbine. No problem. The turbines are so big now, it, it goes right into that low-level jet, which can cause quite a bit of shear, pro, a big shear profile across the diam uh, rotor diameter. Um, and of course, you have complicated wakes that are going on um, in the turbines. If you have complex terrain, again, you can, hopefully you're getting the gist of this. This is a really complicated system now that we have to solve within our, our wind plant box. So just to look at this, the basic problem over, overview and, and some of the things that we use to solve this problem. So it's, it's a multi-scale and multi-physics problem. There's no single model or code that is going to solve this whole uh, spectrum that we need to solve. Um, if you look at the individual components, you could say, okay, mathematical and, and computational models exist for each of these different components. And some examples are, are down here. So, for example, this is um, a, a mesoscale simulation, a weather, a numerical weather prediction simulation. That's the WERF code, if you're familiar with that, weather research and forecasting. Now, that's from John Michalakis. Um, this is a single turbine simulation. Again, we feel pretty good in this regime, but there's still tons to be done. Uh, that's an uh, open foam that Matt Churchfield did. And then we have down to the structure. We, this is a, a finite element model, and that one's, I think, an ANSYS finite element model that Sandia has, has made. Um, and just to point out, these blades now, they're huge. They're, they're, they're 50 meters in length. And they're, as they get bigger, they need to become less dense. Okay, You can't just scale up an existing turbine blade. Um, it, it would be way too heavy. So they become very flexible. So if you go out and look at a, a large turbine today in a decent amount of wind, you will see these blades flexing dramatically. They will flex. They will twist. There's aeroelastic um, uh, bend twist coupling that goes on. They're pretty complicated mechanical systems. So you need to couple all these together. So we need rigorous and efficient and scalable coupling of these models. So just to, to look at um, some resource requirements, okay? What, what are we looking at for simulations today? And what are we looking at for where we want to be? Okay. Um, the simulation I showed of mats before it uses what are called actuator lines. It basically is a line force that exists in the CFD grid. So the CFD grid can be fixed, and you can have this line force moving through, through the domain. It, it, it's, a, it's a greatly simplifying thing um, that, that makes these simulations accessible. But even so, if you're going to say do, for, as an example, and Matt Churchfield went through these, these um, number calculations, but basically let's say we have a 49 turbine wind plant. It's in flat terrain. It's covering 25 kilometers squared. It goes a kilometer into the atmosphere. And you only want to simulate 30 minutes. I won't go into these numbers, but basically, if you're going to simulate 30 minutes, it's going to take about two weeks on a leadership class machine. There are a lot of approximations in this approach. There's a lot of questions about how predictive these actuator line simulations are and how uh, good the CFD is with this kind of grid resolution. Looking forward, we want to be able to resolve the surface of the blades to, to reduce as many of these approximations as we can. If we think about that, so future re simulations with resolved turbines, um, what did he call out? I mean, I mean, we're talking billions of grid points here. We're talking million time steps, uh, billion CPU hours. I mean, if you th look at the numbers here for the future simulations that we're looking at, we're actually resolving down to the, the blade surface, the blade geometry. We're, we're very much talking um, an exascale system problem. What I will say about this for exascale is that the wind plant problem is very well suited because you could see it as a, as a, as a weak scaling problem. Okay? If you're going to do the single turbine problem and, and do the blade resolve single turbine problem in that one box, one turbine, it's a petascale problem. So if we want to do 100 or 1,000 turbines, it's a weak scaling up of those boxes. So it, this fits within the um, desired goal of exascale computing of the bigger problems. Okay? 
it, it is a very nice um, capability problem. I wanted to say a few words about what the DOE Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, how they're looking at this and what they want to do with this. And um, there's the Atmosphere to Electrons Initiative. And over the last year, Steve and I and a lot of other people have been very involved with planning and trying to get this off the ground. And this is pretty exciting um, for me because it, it, it is really a shift for that office. They're really trying to use high fidelity modeling to understand the fundamental physics of whole wind plants. It's a programmatic shift from looking at single turbines to the whole wind plant. And high fidelity modeling is a huge part of that. It is at the core of it. They're doing it right in my mind. They ha are supporting um, an experimental campaign that is validation directed. Um, so the, mo the, the planning meetings we had, we've had modelers, we've had experimentalists working together to design the experiments. Um, we also have um, effort of, a, of a DAP, a data analysis portal. That's going to be at, at PNNL. And so the data should be publicly available, both experimental and, and uh, simulation data is meant to be on the DAP. We've held two well-attended workshops for this program over the, since, um, since January. We had one workshop where we were just looking at creating the modeling and simulation environment to address the wind plant problem about 60 or 70 people at both these and we had another one the wind plant modeling that and this is where we got experimentalists together and the modelers together to to design the, the experimental campaign and the models that will be used in the mod sim environment and for those of you who are into CFD if you haven't heard of it we just had um, an Oscar led workshop on turbulent flow simulation at the exascale and uh, that that workshop report is coming together now uh, the website has a bunch of the um, We'll have all the plenary talks and so forth. But for those of you who are into, into CFD, you might want to take a look at what came out of that. I'll just make a few closing remarks, then I'm going to show a movie. Um, so I, I'm confident that, that HPC does offer us a pathway to reducing the cost of energy for wind energy. Um, capability versus capacity computing. I find this topic to be quite interesting in CFD land. CFD has traditionally been just, you know, the poster child for uh, a capability compu computing. When you get, coming out of the turbulence flow workshop last month, it was very interesting how much, and let me step back and say that was the application, those were all um, DOE application experts as well as just hardcore computing guys as well. And there was a, a consistent call out for capacity computing in the exascale for CFD. And this comes down to uncertainty quantification, sensitivity analysis. And in the exascale context, what people were promoting is not just simulations that could have been done with 1,000 petascale systems, but what they would call are loosely coupled, say, optimization, or loosely coupled ensemble simulations. And I was interested to hear a very consistent call for the importance of ensemble calculations in that context, which there's, there's, a, there's a, a mismatch then when you come to Oscar, for example, who is very much interested in capability computing. Um, but I could, I, I'm happy to talk more about that one off the record if someone wants to. Um, we're looking at still some challenges uh, within this research area. So that mesoscale, numerical weather prediction, trying to couple that with our wind farm simulations. That one is still a pretty big unknown on how to do it well. Uh, coupling turbulent flow across scales like that is not a straightforward thing. Um, uncertainty quantification and sensitivity analysis, we're talking huge simulations here. So what does that look like? Um, is that even possible? Uh, verification and validation. Uh, coupling computation and physical data. Uh, data analysis, I mean, these, these are topics that, that fit broadly in the exascale environment. Multi-fidelity model management. And then looking very much at how does HPC influence the models that industry is using, so the lower fidelity models that, that industry is using. Let's see. Where are we? So I wanted, so my colleague Matt Churchfield put together this little presentation about, well, I'll say that this is a, 
This is a demonstration of how HPC can be used to influence an existing wind plant through, for example, a control system modification. Control systems have been traditionally very turbine centric. So I'm an individual turbine in a wind farm. I want to optimize my own power production. This is a flawed egocentric view. Okay? You, this is where you should really be thinking about the whole. And so the, the example here that Matt's showing, so basically we have one, two, three, four, five wind turbines. And in this case, the wind is going right down the turbine line. Okay? And, and in, in a turbine-centric point of view, each turbine is going to be facing that prevailing wind direction. Okay? The idea is um, detune, if you will, detune each turbine. You give it a yaw angle off of its preferred angle, and then look at the whole plant performance instead. Okay? So the idea is, let's see if that works. I don't know if it's playing. There we go. Okay, so you can see the yaw misalignment. So he's twisting these, each turbine, off the main direction. Okay? And I'll just stop it right there and take a look at this. So on the, on the left here, all the turbines are aligned. So this is an open foam simulation with those actuator lines I was talking about. And each uh, turbine, of course, is living in the wake of all the turbines up in front of it. Over here, you can't see it so much here. You'll, you'll see it more in a moment, perhaps. These guys are yawed, so each one is, is not optimally placed. You can see that the wake kind of goes off to the side there. All right, so you've basically, by taking the, the yaw some number of degrees off of optimal, you've pushed the wake to the side. There's two plots on the right here. This is the total power produced um, by, on, in the two scenarios. These are aligned turbines. These are with the wake redirection. And there's a small percentage here that is consistently um, better uh, for the, for the non-optimal individual turbine co uh, configuration. The bottom plot is the energy produced by the wind plant as a function of time. So there's a couple things here, right? A small performance increase like this can translate to a huge change in the overall energy capture. Okay, this can make a huge difference in the cost of energy that's produced from the plant. Um, and you can see it's a pretty consistent um, um, overproduction there. So an example of how if you just change a control system environment, you can make a significant change in the overall power production of the wind plant. Um, I guess I'm going to stop right there. And I'll turn it over to Vladin. While this thing is setting up, I haven't tried it before, so hopefully it will work. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you can see, my name is Vladan Stevanovic, and I'm coming from two institutions, Colorado School of Mines and Denral, that, that are like four miles apart. And my work uh, is more on the fundamental science side than the applied. Per Steve's remark, previous remark, I'm one of, the, one of those guys that publish papers. Uh, and but I hope to be doing something that is actually at the same time relevant. And then Steve invited me to talk uh, here about materials by design, which basically is, it stands, I mean it's a, it's a hot word, uh, phrase, but it, well, what it stands for, it's basically can we design materials like we design cars? Can we assemb assemble atoms in a certain way, knowing the way, and then be able to predict properties and actually realize those materials in reality. And then when I first heard this kind of definition of what materials by design is, I said, okay, so what? Uh, I mean, since the Bronze Age, humanity was doing the same thing. Huh? I mean, bronze was an alloy that was fabricated for a certain purpose, and then for a certain amount of time, it, it was useful. Uh, and it still is. So what is different now than, than in the Bronze Age? is that we now can model, using high-performance computing, 
uh, and using uh, quantum mechanics, uh, the interactions between the atoms, the interactions between electrons and protons and so forth, and basically predict materials properties. And HPC is a really important part in that. So, okay, motivation is, what this slide shows is the history of materials discovery in 20th century uh, as a function of time. And if you look here, every material that you probably use in your everyday life took from the first paper published on that material until the deployment about 20 plus years. So the idea is, can we use a high performance computing and our knowledge of quantum mechanics to speed up this process? And recognizing this goal, uh, the White House launched the Materials Genome Initiative in 2011, 2012, with the main goal to do uh, materials design uh, twice as fast at half of the cost. So we want to be better, faster, cheaper, uh, every, everything. And Materials uh, uh, Genome Initiative specifically calls for tight integration between uh, computations and experiment and data. So what is the role, and I'm the computational guy and the, and the to some extent, data guy. Uh, so what is the role in this of the, of, the, of the computations and data? And I see three kind of roles. First, we want to have predictive approaches to actually, because, of course, the reality is more complex than we can model it ever. So the question is, how can we appro approximate that reality so to be relevant? So I'm sitting in the place where I'm trying to develop predictive models that can be used on, on uh, high-performance computing machines that can actually produce some, some results. So there is that part in data generation. Then there is a uh, materials genome initiative called specifically for data sharing and uh, building knowledge from, from the data. And that applies to both experimental and, and computational data. A uh, couple of words about MGI work at NREL and Colorado School of Mines. We had a number of programs, and we still have a number of programs, and I'm listing four. Uh, the first one is the Center for Inverse Design that was a previous Energy uh, Frontiers Research Center funding by the, by the Dep U.S. Department of Energy. It stopped existing last summer, but then we recompeted and we got the new EFRC, which is called Center for Next Generation Materials by Design, and these are large... Uh, 20 million-ish uh, dollar efforts uh, over four to five years involving multiple institutions and NREL as, as, as the lead. Uh, there is also an NREL MADB, which is the database con listing all the results from, from, from these efforts that, are, that is hosted by NREL HPC. And then we also have programs which we called uh, TE Design Lab on Thermoelectrics funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, Slide on people, these are the people I will not go, so we have col collaborations with MIT, Harvard, and the other institutions uh, involved, involved in, in these relatively large programs. So what I want to show you here is an example of what I actually do and why are uh, HPC uh, resources very important in, in, in what I do. And I'm, what I'm doing uh, can be called capacity computing. So I'm doing many, many uh, relatively small calculations. And when I say relatively small, I mean a couple of nodes, meaning 50 to 100 cores involved for each calculation take, takes about four to six to 10 hours in, in that order. And, but the number of calculations is hundreds of thousands, uh, summing up to tens of millions CPU hours per project, basically. And the example that I'm showing here is the prediction of new, entirely new materials. So why would we want to do this? Uh, if you look at materials databases, current ones that we have, we know about 100,000 or so uh, materials th that exist, that have been synthesized. But if you uh, look at the periodic table and apply some freshman chemistry rules, you arrive at billions of possible combinations. And the, uh, one, one thing that we could do on a computer much faster than in the lab is try to test those things and see whether those materials would be stable in reality, so it would be synthesizable or not. And this is one example of the things that, that we are doing at Anvil. And in order to do that, so what I'm showing here is just a, like a ladder diagram of energies, and supposedly I want to predict whether a chemist comes to me with an idea of material A2BX4 with some chemical elements and ask me, okay, can you predict will this be stable at all? 
So in order to, and of course we are talking about solids, so we are talking about crystalline materials with well-defined crystal structures. So in order to answer that question, you need to know what the energy of that material is. So all the, you need to sum up all the interactions that happen inside. Uh, and then once when you know the energy, you need to compare it with the energies of all other possible combinations of the same elements. Uh, and then if that turns to be the lowest combination in energy, that then you can predict it's stable. And this is a slightly simplified way, but I'm, I'm trying to, to, to make a case rather than going to the details. Uh, but that A2BX4 can potentially exist in numerous different crystal structures. And this is where the one side of the problem is, is how do we know in which crystal structures it will exist. For the known materials we know, but for the completely unknown things we don't. And this is the problem that we call structure prediction. And because every structure might have a different energy and we are interested in the finding the lowest energy crystal structure for that for that particular composition. Uh, what do we do in calculations? We are basically solving quantum mechanical Schrodinger's equation, which is an analogous of Newton's equations in classical mechanics. And when you have a crystal structure, which is here represented by this grid, where the, the ions or the, pro or the nuclei of the atoms sit in every grid point, then you have nuclei in grid points and then electrons represented as these smileys are supposedly wandering around, confined in this space of the crystal. And what you want to solve is basically solve for the dynamics of the electrons, represented by this relatively complicated equation. I mean, it's much less complicated than Navier's talks, but it's still pretty complicated because you need to solve it for very many electrons at the same time. And they are coupled because they interact both with, with nuclei, but they interact among themselves. And this is what makes the problem very complex. Uh, so this problem, and again, not going into the details, this problem has been not solved, but uh, useful approximations have been developed. And the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 98 was given to these two guys, to Walter Kohn and uh, John Popel, uh, one for the development of density functional theory, which is the first principles or ab initio calculations as it is uh, also called in the high performance computing community. Uh, and John Popel for the first useful impl implementation of density functional theory into an actual code. Uh, okay, so what are the typical inputs and outputs of our calculations? Well, so what I input in my calculations are uh, the positions of every atom in a crystal structure because the crystal is a periodic system so you need to define that only for a single unit cell and then it's periodically repeated. And I need to put atoms in some with, with some coordinates into the box and then let the codes output the total energy of the system, uh, electronic structure and so forth. Uh, so this is, this is what is typically done. And then I'm, uh, the input is actually assumes a certain crystal structure. So going back to the problem that I, that I uh, initially started talking about, how do we know which crystal structure should we assume? Uh, the most trivial solution to this problem that I will be showing you, to, you, you today. There are many more, many com more complex methods to, to determine this, but the simplest way is to try, if I'm interested in A2BX4 chemical formula, I can go into the databases. We know 100,000 materials. I can basically look similar uh, materials crystallizing in the same, I mean, having the same chemical formula in how many different crystal structures they crystallize. And I can use that as an ensemble, an ensemble of crystal structures as my test set. And so I, if I can perform calculations on every one of those, I could approximate the lowest energy structure somehow. This is trivial in principle, but in practice is much less trivial. Because if you go into the databases, for A2BX4, there are about 40 different crystal structures that known materials assume. Again, you are, lim you are basing everything, uh, your results on the existing knowledge, uh, which is a, an approximation again, but still. Uh, there are about 40, 40 different crystal structures, okay? And then if you are interested in about 400 of these combinations of A2BX4, and then I didn't talk about some details of magnetic structures and blah, 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 so not going into real details, but you are easily climbing to hundreds of thousands of calculations. Independent calculations, each of which requires uh, 
couple of tens of cores, so from 20 to, to 200 cores lasting in, in the order of 10 hours. So we are easily talking about 10 million CPU hours. And this is a relatively, conceptually relatively simple thing. Okay, uh, we did this uh, for the A to BX4 system. We did it for many more systems since then, but like a couple of years ago. And did, this took us about 10 million CPU hours. And this was done on NREL HPC. And I need to say that NREL HPC was really instrumental in achieving this. Of course, then there is the whole uh, business about not launching all these jobs by hand. And, you know, we, there are some software developments about how to automata automatize all that. Uh, specifically for first principles or DFT calculations and to facilitate the extraction of data, the data analysis and, and, and that kind of stuff. I will not be talking about that, but that was also part of the work where HPC hel uh, NREL HPC helped us a lot. Uh, and then what I'm showing is the relevance of these kinds of things. So what I'm showing here is the comparison with experiments on a material that, that is known, so it's not new material, so it's kind of a test how all this business works. And the material is a mineral, manganese silicon 4 uh, having that kind of chemical formula, 214. And w once when you do these kinds of calculations, then you can apply some additional physical models, and then you can construct these kinds of phase diagrams of the PO2 versus, uh, so oxygen partial pressure versus temperature, which are the typical handles that experimentalists have in, in the lab. Uh, it's the temperature and pressure. And then the green uh, line or the green region is the region of stability of this material. So this is an output of, of our calculations. And as you can see, experimental uh, synthesis really happened inside, in, in, inside that green, green area, which it kind of provides confidence that what we are doing is actually the correct. Uh, this is not one example. We have many, many more of these. So this is another system, Cobalt 2 Zinc 4 where you can have, so again, the green region is the region of the material that we want, and the other regions are uh, regions of the existence of other phases. Uh, apologies for, for the colors. I was trying to avoid all the national flags I, I know. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the synthesis, bulk synthesis. This is my colleagues at NREL did it in, in tin film chambers, growing this material, and as you can see, the, the agreement is good. Uh, then this was also used, as initially I said, to predict entirely new materials. So colleagues of mine used the approach that we together developed. And while I was focusing on A2BX4 materials, they were focusing on ABX materials. They had predictions of about 50 new, completely new, never before synthesized materials. And then experimentalists from Northwestern University, our, our colleagues managed to synthesize nearly 30 of those in the crystal structures predicted by the theory. And this was published in Nature Chemistry uh, like a month or two, a month or two ago. And this is, I believe, an illustrative example of why do we need HPC. Um, so I will wrap up now uh, and basically repeating everything that I said so far that uh, modern material, material science cannot be done without computers. Uh, we need significant computing, co computer, computing resources. Uh, for the work that I do, I, it's 1,000 petascale computers is more useful than an exascale computer. So when I was starting my, my PhD sometime in 2005, 2006, big computers then, I was doing it in Switzerland, uh, big computer then was like 1,000 cores or, or so. So relatively much smaller than what we have today. And then the question, I mean, it, it was obvious that uh, much larger machines are coming. And then the whole field was kind of wondering, the field of ab initio, first principle calculations, was wondering where, where shall we go? Sh shall we pursue linear scaling methods and really do uh, large scale compu computing with large system sizes? Or shall we, uh, shall we go for doing uh, many more calculations at the same time in parallel? And the field kind of split in two. Uh, the linear scaling is not yet there. And uh, the high, what we call in, in our field, uh, we don't call it capacity computing, we call it high throughput computing, apparently is taking over, uh, or at least to my, to my knowledge is taking over. And it's relevant for experimentalists. Experimentalists really 
uh, I think, found, finally found use of, of theory. Uh, as, and, and that is really uh, a result of, co of a combination of theory plus high-performance computing, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you guys very much. Very, very interesting. Um, as the moderator, I'm going to take the liberty of being the first to ask some questions. So I make sure I get mine in, if that's OK. Um, but uh, I have a, a number of them, actually. But Steve, I wanted to start with you uh, uh, about the center. You know, I was intrigued uh, with one of your early slides where you had a, a, you know, the typical pyramid. And you said that some of the Office of Science Supercomputing Center is really focused at the tip of the spear, but that NREL was focused a little bit more on the missing middle, if, if I understood that. And so I, I kind of have two questions. One is, can those, those more capacity problems be offloaded onto a cloud, or do you see that happening? Um, and then uh, also, if that is uh, a, a, a part of the NREL workload, how do you see that shifting in light of all the discussions that we've had here today on Exascale? So we've sort of talked about the tip of the spear a lot, and yet you're talking about a, a center that focuses a lot in, in the middle range. Yeah, th that's an excellent question. Um, so there are cloud-like applications that are certainly done at our facility. And when sometimes they involve proprietary information or work with a industrial partner, I would prefer that that be protected within NREL's firewall. Mm -hmm. So while there, while some of those calculations can be done in a cloud-like environment, um, it's they would prefer it not be done in the cloud. Got it. So so that's that's one avenue. The other, when I when I look at sort of the role we play, um, and it's not just about the computing, and and there's been a conscious investment by EERE in expertise to work closely with the domain specialists. Um, in the in the area of modeling and simulation f that's important to these specific domains to get them started at all mm -hmm. right? and part of the notion is not to be um, uh, duplicate what's done by the leadership class facilities but to get folks started and to graduate them as the field matures as the problems mature as they get as they gain um, comfortability as the as the models that they use um, advance and to graduate those so that they use the leadership class facilities that the Office of Science is, is providing. Do those users uh, have to have EERE funding, or do they just have to have a project that is aligned with the EERE mission area? So, so there's priority given to EERE-funded projects, okay. but it's not a requirement. It's not a requirement. Okay, great. Do we have other so questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, did you? Vlad, did you want to say? Anything about cloud computing? And well, okay, I'm not really a specialist for, for cloud computing. Uh, I guess the things that I'm doing, because it, they still involve uh, using in the order of, of between 50 and 100 cores, which have to be connected with the fast, fast network. We use quite a lot of FFT uh, to do things that we do. Uh, I'm not sure how can that be implemented in a cloud. Uh, if, if there is a cloud that provides those kinds of capabilities, that you can have a cluster of 100 cores somewhere, um, then probably yes, but I'm not aware of that. Do we have any other uh, questions from anyone out in the audience? Great, right here, and then over here to Vijay. This is uh, more point than a question. John Popel got the Nobel Prize Award for computational methods in theoretical chemistry, not just EFT, the wave function sure. methods yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. I agree. <laughs> Great. DJ? Quick question. I saw a slide in which you said that the behavior of a single turbine is quite different compared to behavior of collection of turbines in a wind farm, right? And I imagine part of the implication was that it can lead to larger failure rates of blades when they are in a farm. And so I, I'm 
my question is, are you, does the lab consult with people who are operating, building farms, and are we in a position to simulate uh, uh, a collection of 5,200 wind farms within a given location and so forth? Where, where is the state of the art in that? That's question one. And two, is there any work going on vertical turbines as opposed to these ultra-long 50-meter blades? Okay, let's see. So let me just clarify. The, um, the failure rates are mainly seen in gearboxes and bearings. The, I don't know so much about the blade failure rates. So this is where I'm not a domain expert. I'm, I'm, I'm growing into one, but I'm more on the, you know, Navier-Stokes is my domain more so than uh, you know, actual blade failure modes. Um, but you are seeing significant failure rates. So let me ask you this. If you're seeing in gearboxes, yeah. is it tied to a greater density of blades? Uh, I mean, wind, uh, sort of windmills, greater density? Right, so the whole system is going to be experiencing. Right, yeah. When you put, put the turbine in, in the wind farm, you get, you might have seen it. Everyone is living in the wake of another turbine, effectively. And that brings much more oscillatory uh, forcing to those systems. And so they see a lot more um, related oscillations, force oscillations, that a single turbine would not see. So that's uh, basically what I meant by, by that. Now, your first question was working with, how would you say that again? Basically, uh, like it. It's not good, <laughs> right? The, the models that they're using to design the, the wind plants right now, there are very few people who are doing the kind of simulations that, that I was showing um, in designing the wind plants. And, and the high fidelity simulations, at best, will only be a point check, right? They'll basically come up with the design and they can basically do a point <coughs> check because the simulations are so expensive. So they use much uh, uh, lower fidelity models in the design of the wind plants, um, linearized type models for designing the wind plants. And then when they're built, they often underperform, right? Because their models were not good enough. Mm -hmm. so, so the state of the art and actually affecting how the wind plants are designed, HPC is, is beginning to help, but it can do a lot more. Both, right? I mean, the, ex the, the calculations are so expensive to do if you're going to, the state of the art calculations, like I was trying to get at, they're, they're petascale type simulations, and you're going to be able to get a 30 minutes uh, simulated time over a couple of weeks on Mira. Right, so that's a, a great limitation in using it in design. <coughs> that kind of calculation, in my mind, it, its purpose is really in understanding the system and affecting changes in the lower models that are actually used to design the, the wind plants. Oh, yes, yes. The, 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 for example, the DTU guys seem to always be in some number at the NWTC. And Germany, and you know, we have a lot of uh, European collaboration going on for this problem. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we. Um, so, so wind turbine data is, is, and the failure rates are are sort of closely held company secrets, if you will. Right. So, um, if probably the, uh, if you go a, a, maybe a mile south and a couple miles west, that that's the National Wind Technology Center. So there's a uh, handful of utility scale turbines there. So when Mike talked about NWTC, it's just, I think it's just over the hill. You just can't see them, but um, they're there. So we, we formed a gearbox collaborative. We collected gearbox failure data from a handful, and I, and I don't know the exact number, I think it's over a dozen owner operators of wind farms and try to find root cause analysis of operating conditions and failure modes to go back and then um, update both um, the operating conditions or, or, or the, uh, the control system, the control sequences, and to help the industry improve to reduce the mean time to failure. And some of that came back to, well, we're poor, our turbines are living in significant turbulent regimes due to the wakes and the interaction of the upwind turbines. How can we steer the wakes by adjusting the pitch and the yaw of the blades? Um, so that, um, so it, what the video that Mike showed was showing the steering of the wakes, which is some of the results of that, of taking data of failure rates. So it, it, it has a, a multiplicative effect, both 
it's reducing the cost of, of the energy by improving the energy capture, plus it's putting the turbines in a more stable environment so they're not, you know, they're not going through the chop of the upwind turbines, which again puts stress on the gearbox. Um, and then to answer your second question about vertical axis yeah, just turbines, the energy capture potential of a turbine, whether it's vertical or horizontal, is proportional to the swept area. Right? And you've got to get your turbine into the right wind regime. So you actually the get them sell up, the turbines we have at, at NWTC, then the cell, the gearbox hits up about 80 meters. And the, you're into the bottom of the planetary boundary layer where you get very stable night flows. You want to be able to take advantage of that with a vertical turbine or a vertical axis turbine that sort of spins like this as opposed to like this. They have to be much larger systems. So, so your energy capture potential per installation is much smaller unless you start packing them like trees and then, then they have greater impacts on each other. So the state of the art right now really is three blade um, horizontal axis turbines. And if you go offshore, they're, they're just massive um, 10 megawatt systems are being deployed. I know we have a question in the back here, but while we're still on this topic, I, I had one just so we don't lose the thread. It's kind of related to what Vijay was saying. Mike, you're doing this modeling now of farms to understand the vorticity between the different uh, uh, um, the individual turbines and how they're having an impact. But if this is so sensitive from a company perspective, who funds you to do this? Is it all done on like a work for others from a company and it's proprietary? Or does this data then somehow get back out to industry so that industry then can use it to make adjustments in how the farms are set up? The, um, or is that question too sensitive? No, no, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. Let me, um, let me try, Steve, before I hand it off. Um, right, so everything we're doing and is open source. I mean, I mean, we do have a, a, a work for others part in our portfolio. But everything that I'm talking about is all open source. And that's from the, the data that is gathered in the experiments, the simulations that we're doing, to the software that the Department of Energy is trying to develop. It, it is all meant to be open source. Um, and then, for, and then for, for my part in this, or for our part in this, I mean, we, we want to deal with open source systems to demonstrate the capability. We want those capabilities then influence what the, the industry itself is using, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we're trying to make the come up with the ground truth simulations and the state of the art and the, and the computational methods for solving the systems and we want the industry to take those things and, and to push the, 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 the process. And then for our validation, for example, we have a, a three turbine wind farm down that's being put up in the SWIFT facility in Texas that Sandia is putting up. Um, so part of our experimental validation of these systems is to work with that open source system. So. So the Gearbox Reliability Cooperative was funded by the Department of Energy Wind Program mm -hmm. okay. to, to fund uh, lab resources, staff time and, res and uh, sort of capabilities in, in computing to anonymize the data to sh so that each company could see its data and everybody else's, but, but you couldn't, you knew which was yours, but you couldn't um, identify anybody else's directly. So it was supported, the companies came because they realized that they didn't have enough data all in their own wow. to be able to find the whole problem, to find that needle in the haystack. But collectively, they could. Got it. So DOE supported the, the gathering of the tribes to get together. Um, NREL was the trusted holder of the data without sharing whose data was which, associated with which particular installation. And then, then it was shared. They all could see the data, but they didn't know whose was which. Cool. Very good. Now, I think we had questions in the back. Someone else had a mic? Yeah. So actually, Susie stole my question. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> but, but I kind of have a follow-on. Uh, so are there issues around intellectual property? And, and do you have a kind of coordinated intellectual property agreement that your industry folks sign? I, I don't know what the intellectual property arrangement was with the gearbox reliability, but for typical collaboration where there's a if it's a funds in cooperative research and development agreement, if it's a funds in CRADA, then the company owns its pre-existing IP, joint IP is governed by whatever terms are negotiated within the CRADA agreement. So, so you're signing CRADA agreements even if no real money is flowing from it, again, companies? It, so there was, there was the, 
the arrangement, I, I, I don't know what the arrangement was done with the gearbox reliability cooperative that was set okay. up. But I know the intellectual property will depend on the terms of the specific um, trade agreement. Yeah, okay. Just, Question over um, here? I'll maybe just follow one more oh. little bit to that. For one, one of the things we're doing right now is we're working with Siemens. And that did start under a CRADA, and um, Siemens has been great on this one because we're basically doing a validation of our turbine models with the uh, big 2.3 megawatt Siemens turbine that's just, as Steve said, over the hill from here. And um, we'll be publishing that data. We just need to um, mask the data in the sense to, to make it uh, nonspecific. So just another example of what we're doing with the industry there. Back here, just, Doug. Yeah, just a, just a comment. The, uh, the ECI, the DOE ECI project can and likely will support applications that uh, need ensembles as opposed to, you know, one big honking simulation. The point is, is we're seeing lots of need for uh, sensitivity, uh, optimization, uncertainty quantification. Uh, so there, there's, you know, those sorts of workflows absolutely uh, can and will be supported. Uh, do you worry about uh, taking too much ener energy out of the uh, the motion of the air? I mean, if you stop it all, uh, it's, it's not going to rain in Kansas Kansas anymore, and they're going to be irritated. That's a fun question. Yeah, we are. It's um. So this is um. If you have the wind plant centric view, you can look at your weather forcing as a one way forcing. If you're a farm that is sitting behind a very large wind plant, then you were, are very much interested in the two-way coupling aspect. So part of this um, mesoscale, microscale coupling initiative that I, that I spoke briefly about, it is, it is interested very much in the one-way coupling of forcing the wind farms, but there is also great interest in, in the two-way coupling. What does a wind farm do to local weather patterns? So, so definitely. Uh, Julie Lundquist is, a, is the name that comes to mind up at CU Boulder, who is very much looking at that. Um, measurement point of view from, from out in the field measurements of changes in precipitation in particular um, in the vicinity of large wind farms. But if you think of the uh, wind turbines, uh, a wind farm as being a small, um, almost a small mountain, right? Because it puts a drag on the bottom of the planetary boundary layer. So it's going to slow it down. You, you, you will alter the everything from precipitable water to freeze-thaw cycles. Right. So, so if you know what they are, that, that could be to your advantage. Right. You could use it strategically, not just, holy cow, what are we going to do? Right. So knowing how close you can space them, um, what the impacts are, um, you certainly don't want to put in turbines in Kansas that turns Iowa into a dust bowl. One more interesting point on, on that is um, what if you build a wind farm and then someone builds a wind farm right in front of you? Right? Oh. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Okay. Listen, we are running a little bit ahead of schedule, uncharacteristically, because we usually are running behind with so many questions. But we're going to take advantage of that right now. And Earl, could you come up and maybe we can do the ROI discussion now. And our colleagues here from NREL will be here and we'll have a break in about 15 minutes after uh, Earl finishes his talk. And they're available for some more Q&A. Thank you.